What a joy to have you here to worship with us as Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church on this, the 10th of May in the year 2020. It is Mother's Day, and so happy Mother's Day to all of the moms out there. And I hope all of you are finding ways to honor your mothers or others who have been like mothers uh, to you and just have been blessings in your life. There are so many uh, simple and profound ways to do that, and I hope you have found something that will have meaning for you. By way of announcement, on Tuesday, May 26th at 7 p.m., we will be having a special charge conference for the sole purpose of approving the acceptance of the Payment Protection Program loan. Uh, you may be familiar with those PPPs as part of the CARES Act, the, um, the package to help small businesses uh, in this difficult time with the pandemic. We were eligible and therefore applied and have been awarded a sum to help uh, pay the staff over this time when we have been uh, working very differently and um, with a different income flow, not gathering every Sunday in worship. So that will be on May 26 at 7 p.m. And there will be more information, login information, and all that you need uh, coming your way soon. So now uh, let us gather in the spirit of worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. The risen Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. And now let us pray. As we gather, help us remember, God, that you call us to work for your glory not ours. Help us to remember, God, that we worship your glory, not ours. Amen. And now I have a, a wonderful hymn, uh, thanks to the Wilsons, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. Any of you read the scripture? There's always a link to it in our e news during the week. And if you did, you might find this little five verses from the book of Acts a little strange, a little odd, out of place, disconnected. Uh, it's five verses about Stephen seeing God's majesty, stating what he sees to a crowd that 
responds by blocking their ears, literally going, yeah. And then they stoned him while some guy named Saul holds their coats for them. And then Stephen echoes Jesus's words from the cross, asking God to forgive them. And then having said that, he dies. Well, obviously we're missing some of the backstory here, right? I mean, who is Stephen anyways? And why are people so mad at him? Well, to figure all this out, we kind of have to backtrack a little bit into the book of Acts. So if we go back to the beginning of chapter six, we start to get Stephen's story. You see, this is when the church truly becomes the church. And the church folks start complaining to the 12, you know, the 11 of Jesus' original apostles, plus the one that they selected to join them by drawing lots, you know, to take Judas's place. Well, I've told you before that I think we all read scripture through our own lens of experience. And that's why it helps so much to read it together and get our different perspectives. It's the only way we can get a real, true reading of scripture. Because this is one of those passages that when I read, takes on a life of its own. You see, because I read this passage in um, chapter six of Acts as someone who preaches on Sunday mornings. And so I add some details to the reading that you're not going to find in scripture, but I'm sure they should be there. You see, I picture that the 12 are at the back of the sanctuary, you know, waiting for the prelude so they can process up the aisle to lead worship. And that's when people start coming up to them. You know, first it's this one saying, um, Peter, I know you're busy, but well, this is what they're complaining about. It's the Hellenists or the Greeks. Uh, they think that their widows are being shortchanged in the food distribution. They think the Jewish widows are getting more of the food and the Greek widows getting less. And so right there in the narthex, right as worship is about to start, is when the Greeks and the Jews want the disciples to make things right. Right then, right there even as the organist is playing those final notes of the prelude. Well, the disciples handle it pretty well, I must say. You know, it's like they get how church life works, group dynamics, organizational, sociology, whatever you want to call it. And so they say, listen, we're preachers. Our job is to proclaim the word. We can't set that aside to wait on tables. So here is what you could do, though. You can pick seven of you, you know, people of wisdom and spirit, and, and they can oversee this ministry so we can focus on preaching. Well, everyone's happy with this idea. So, you know, this may be one of my favorite verses, actually, of passages about church life, because the problem is so real. And the whole way it's handled is so real. We hear variations on it every day, right? And the disciples' response is so brilliant because no one person or group can or should do all the work of the church. Everyone has a role to play. And, you know, they don't just name a task force and tell them to report back in a couple of months with a plan. They empower the people to do the work of the church because that's what it takes to be the church. So they name these seven folks and they stand up in this worship service so they can be blessed and anointed for their ministry and sent out to do their work. And one of these is this guy named Stephen. And Luke tells us that Stephen is a man full of faith. Stephen assumes his new role and we hear that he does great wonders and signs among the people. And we've seen that happen to church volunteers, haven't we? 
we give them a job to do and it's so much the right job for them that they not only do it well, they do it to the glory of God. It takes on a life beyond them. Amazing things happen. Lives are changed. Of course, it's no surprise that these wonders and signs are happening in a feeding ministry, right? I mean, that's often where we can most easily see God's God at work transforming lives. Lives of both the folks serving and the folks being served. I mean, if you've ever helped at Piece of Bread, you know what I'm talking about. So what happens next? Well, some folks start questioning Stephen, you know, raising questions about his authority, wondering about these signs and wonders. And uh, they go so far as to arrest him. They haul Stephen into court. And then most of chapter 7 is this long speech that he gives. It's, it's not even a sermon, really. It's a, it's a lecture. I mean, he recounts biblical history in detail. But he doesn't even name Jesus, although he does tell his accusers that they are responsible for murdering Jesus. Uh, he even uses that odd Old Testament term for difficult people addressing them as stiff-necked. Yeah, well, talk about winning friends and influencing enemies. Poor Stephen. I mean, didn't anyone tell him you don't win people over with arguments and lectures? You win them over by witnessing to your faith, by sharing your experience of Jesus. I mean, maybe he was too busy feeding the widows to learn much about preaching, though. We'll, we'll cut him a break. And that's how we get to the five verses that are before us today. But filled with the Holy Spirit... He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold their sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Well, Stephen gets it in these last few verses, right? These last few moments of his life. He tells what he sees. He bears witness with his words, just as he did with actions earlier. And he does with actions right here at the end of his life. He shows them what a changed life looks like as he prays for them to be forgiven and gives his life into God's hands. You see, Christian faith is not primarily about doctrine or even behavior. It's about changed lives. And it's only when your life has been changed that you can witness to that so that others might experience the same. Now, I talk a lot about putting faith into action, and I sincerely believe we are called to that. But, you know, action isn't an end unto itself. I mean, maybe the best way to explain it is for me to remind you of a story that Mike Sherry shared back in the fall during the stewardship drive when we had asked him to talk about the piece of bread ministry. And when he was sharing that, he talked about the aprons that we wear at the piece of bread ministry and when we do our Christmas dinner, right? These aprons don't have our church name on them. They don't say Blackstone Valley United Methodist Church. They say this meal made possible by the love of Jesus Christ. You see, we're witnesses, witnesses to our faith. 
Our story makes no sense without Jesus. It's not about us. What we do, we do because of Jesus. We're not serving because our church wants to put on a meal. We're serving because Jesus calls us to feed the hungry. Stephen is remembered as the first martyr of the Christian church. Now, the word martyr is a transliteration of the Greek word for witness by their lives and by their deaths. Martyrs bear witness for Jesus Christ. I hope that none of you ever find yourself in Stephen's situation with an angry mob throwing stones at you. But you are going to face pushback when you witness for Christ. So may you be such people who, even when rejected and persecuted, rise above it and may Christ be seen through you as you give glory to him. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. A loving God, we give you thanks for the mothers in our lives, for the mothers who gave us birth and for those who have raised us and nurtured us as though we were their own children. And we ask that you comfort those today who are missing their mothers and those mothers who are missing their children. Some are parted by distance or death, some by uh, temporary restrictions for public health. Comfort those who made the decision to give up their child or to not give birth. And comfort those who have longed to be biological mothers and haven't had the opportunity. And we pray for those whose mothers have disappointed them. We ask for grace in relationships where there's pain and bitterness, for healing in relationships where there's been abuse or violence, we ask that you might use us, our congregation, to be a space where people can feel nurtured and have their gifts and talents appreciated and nurtured and their relationships healed. Today, we ask you to just be with mothers all around the world, mothers who struggle to feed their children, mothers who are homeless, mothers who are refugees, mothers who must teach their children about the dangers of bombs and bullets. Help us create a world where mothers can raise their children in peace and plenty. Oh God, hear our prayer. Amen. We pray also for the many needs in our congregation and our extended families. Today we pray especially for Mert, Stella, Bev, Glenn, Dot, Paul, Bill, Marjorie, John, Luann, and Sue. We ask God that you continue to be with Laura, with Molly, with all those who are struggling in any way. To be with the members of our church and community who have been laid off from work, with the healthcare workers, the pharmacy and grocery staff, and all those who are working to keep us safe and healthy while risking their own health. I ask you to be with all of those leaders who are making such difficult decisions and trying to figure out 
uh, new ways of living in these times and help us to find our way through the decisions that are made, that we might uh, do those things that will protect our whole community the best way possible. And we pray most especially today, God, for those who are longing to see their families who haven't been together in two months. We pray especially for those with family in nursing homes and care facilities and the isolation they're experiencing these days. All these prayers we trust to you, God, knowing that you can bring wholeness from our brokenness. And in that spirit of confidence, we pray together as Jesus teaches us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we prepare to go our separate ways, or return to our uh, households, uh, before we enjoy our closing hymn, I send you forth with these words from Romans 15, verses 5 to 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people say. And now, uh, thanks to Marilyn, we'll be able to hear, My life is in you, Lord. Praise. 